Welcome back. We're joined by Heather Reisman, founder and CEO of Indigo. And Heather, we're talking about, um, you know, a course correction that Indigo's making. And I'm curious from your point of view, what success looks like. We, we could say, well, that's a return to big profitability, of yeah, course. Yeah. Um, we would watch sales. Yeah. What does it mean to you, though, personally? The first is that our customers say, Indigo that I love is back and doing things that matter. And there's so much that we can do that matters to them. And they're always was so much we can do. And I know you want to at some point talk about how do I feel about this industry. Mm -hmm. um, there is more than ever that we can do, not just to connect people with the books they want to read, but with the ideas that they're trying to under to excavate, how they're making sense of the world. So um, success first is we start to see the kind of growth in customer engagement and we don't have people writing, as someone wrote to the Globe and Mail last week, where is my indigo? That That's must, the that first must cut. To his, oh, yeah. You can't imagine. You've been part of a push to uh, make books available to Canadians, if right. I can put it that way. You tried to bring borders to this country. Right. You uh, launched indigo. You acquired chapters. All of that, of course, driven by somebody who actually loves books right. and authors and ideas. Uh, but in the face of that, I mean, this all... All along, the demise of publishing right. uh, has maybe been exaggerated, but it's been there, right? We're reading less, we're reading online. We're right. just How do you feel today about the health of bookstores publishing versus 27 years ago? Yeah. You know, books have been far more resilient than anybody imagined. I remember my first sleepless night after I sold Kobo and it was a fabulous success was wow, the e-reading business has gone from zero to 20% in 24 months. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have 50% people. Well, guess what happened? Ebooks remained 17, 18%. Audiobooks are there and they have grown, but they're at 7%, 8%. Does this all take away? Yes, and it does affect the economics, but the first point is the physical article remains a resilient business. It's not as big as it was when you didn't have 20% going or 4%, but that's the underlying point. Yep. It's more resilient than we think. That said, people's attention spans are affected. We have an opportunity to play in that, right? We have an opportunity to find ways to inspire long form reading. And that's something I care a lot about. I mean, you put your name on the books, Heather's right. Picks. Uh, right. Obviously that that's a personal sort of right. relationship with your customers. Right. All along, Amazon has been in the room here, um, Heather, selling books at a loss throughout its yes. history, yeah. uh, of course, and then moving into the e-reading space in a way that's quite threatening. Right. How, what's the relationship with Amazon today? So interestingly, in Canada, Amazon is not the problem. We came out of COVID, so I was still running the business during COVID. Mm -hmm. We came out of COVID, we grew our market share our book market share and our overall market share at those things people wanted, right? We grew it. Um, I will say uh, with respect that when we uh, misstep as we have this last number of months, almost two years, it's the independents who gain the sales, not Amazon. Hmm. And we need the independents. This is an important ecosystem. What I would like to do is I wanna thrive and I want them to thrive. Right. Um, I don't see Amazon Honestly, in Canada, we have kept Amazon at bay. And Amazon will say that. One of the things you did do... But they did change the economics of the online business. And sure that did. is something we have to address. And well, and is being addressed in some yeah. ways in the courts right now yeah. in the U.S., yes. some of their practices. Yes. You introduced non-book items. And I can yes. remember 2014, yes. big strategic shift. Right. And there was sort of a throw pillows at Indigo. What's happening? Right. It's the death of the bookstore. Right. It's actually been the revitalization of the bookstore because people come for an experience, I right. think, and for, I did all my Christmas shopping right. at the COVID year right. online right. at Indigo, literally right. everything. It, it, because you have so many non-book items, right. how much of that is curated by, I don't wanna say you personally, but when you say it's easy to get off brand with barbecues and, right. and you know sex toys, right. the curation is pretty key. Curation is key. I like to call it um, what we will have and what we have had are enriching to lifestyle mm -hmm. for book lovers. So how did we end up with pillows? Not because we were going into the home decor business, but I, we were inspired by the idea of putting beautiful poetry 
on a pillow and taking the words out of the book. When it is an item that has an, a, a reason and why we have it. Now, did it get a bit further than it should have been? Yes, and probably needed to be pulled back a bit. But what happened in the last two years is it just went all the way, right? right? We were actually, the first thing I talked to my new CEO at the time about was uh, thoughtful curation. It's a place for book lovers, for the cultural part, for the beauty. And so you need to be extremely thoughtful so that a book lover says, it's not overwhelming my shopping experience, it is additive. So that is the process now. Who are we, where can we enrich the lives? Mm -hmm. Where is it a item other than, I mean, we always sold journals, we always sold gift wrap. So we're rethinking all of that in the context of today. You've also been willing to take positions on things, mm -hmm. um, including, you know, maybe this sounds like small things, but over time it's actually caused uh, headlines, right? right? You wouldn't put Mein Kampf in the stores. Right. You wouldn't put the Harper's Magazine that was recopying the Prophet Muhammad cartoon. Right. These are decisions that you have yes. to make. Do they feel right in retrospect? Uh, some were, one of those two, one was right, one was wrong. So um, as a private business, meaning it's a public company, but private as opposed to government, yep. I made the decision that selling Mein Kampf was not something we would do. But I would never, as I wrote in an op-ed at the time, make, uh, suggest the country not sell it. It's available in libraries. People need to study it. Just we didn't want to. Mm -hmm. The decision on the Prophet Muhammad, which was driven at the time by people in our stores who were fearful that if they sold it, they would be at risk. So it was, it was right to worry about their safety. It was wrong to take it off the shelves. We should have dealt with the safety differently. We have now, a, and have had for many years, a very clear policy about what we will and won't carry. And books that have ideas or magazines that people don't like, mm -hmm. as long as it's not details and instructions on how to create weapons of mass destruction, child pornography, or has as its intent the full annihilation of a group, it's available. We're going to take a quick, quick break, yeah. but coming up, literacy became a big part of Heather Eastman's philanthropy. We'll talk about that on the other side of this break. Stay with us. <laughs> 